Yes, good morning and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to Gordon Smith. Uh, thank you for joining the third event, AI and the Society Online Series. Uh, the title of this seminar is Robotics and Embodiment. I am Tomoko Tamari. I will act as chair for today's event. So I am sociologist at the Institute for Creative and Cultural Entrepreneurship, Gordon Smith University of London. So I am not either a robotist uh, no uh, engineer or designer, but hope the event could create an interesting dialogue between scholars who are working in robotics and embodiment from different approaches. So before introducing our speakers, um, I'd like to uh, mention a few housekeeping points. And fortunately, our time is limited, so we won't have Q&A discussion with the floor. Uh, if you wish to direct your comments or questions uh, panelists privately, uh, you will find their profile information and contact detail on our Eventbrite site, uh, Eventbrite pages. And also, please be aware that this event will be recorded in order to share with those who are not able to attend today. The link, the video will be posted on our Eventbrite page and on the blog of the Institute for Creative and the cultural entrepreneurship goals. So, uh, okay, so now I think let's get started. Uh, as I mentioned, this is the AI and the society leads, the third seminar. We had an exciting discussion on new media literacy and the politics in the first seminar. And the main topic was to contextualize the various media texts and the formats and examine system behind search engine in order to explore new media literacy. The second seminar focused on digital archives and discussed the impact of artificial intelligence on practices of meaning making and memory formation. Today, we focus on robotics and embodiment. So artificial intelligence and robotics are different fields, AI and uh, intangible computer program designed to complete tasks. But the robot is a tangible machine which is programmable to interact with the physical environment. So recently there are, however, robots which are programmed by AI. So the development of artificial intelligent robots such as self-driving cars, humanoid robots and autonomous navigation drones, these are seen as evidence of collaboration of the two fields. So computer scientists who are involved in robotics, Ralph Pfeiffer and Fosse Bongard, state that artificial intelligence interdisciplinary research has three goals. First one, understanding a biological system, which means the mechanisms that brings about intelligent from intelligent, intelligent behavior in humans or animals. The second, the abstract of a general principle of intelligent behavior. And the third, application of these principles to design of useful artifacts. They are inspired by biology and emphasizes the significance of a physical system, the body, uh, to understand, better understand mechanism of intelligence. For them, mechanism refer not only to neural mechanism of the information processing in the brain, but also the body of the agent and its interactions with environment in the, in the world. So in this side, embodiment is a key concept, which means having a body. More precisely, they explore how body, how having a body affects intelligence. So Professor Ida will introduce and further discuss on embody, embodied intelligence from perspective of uh, soft robotics today. And uh, this perspective, uh, embodied in the intelligence, resonates to some degree with the approach of body studies. Also, there have been a focus of significance of the body in social science since 1980s, the emergence of the interdisciplinary field of body studies has led uh, an increasing, increasing attention to the notion of embodiment 
in recent decades. So body studies consider not only how the body can help us understand in the ways which social structure influenced human life, but also how the body affects what we can do or what the body can do. So arguing against the cultural heritage of Western thought, the body studies scholars offer an embodied mind paradigm, which considers that the mind is irreducible to neural information processing and insists that the mind is dependent on the kind of experience that comes from having a body with various sensor mind, sensory motor capacities. This is to say that the both embodied intelligence in biologically inspired robotics and the embodied mind paradigm in social science challenge cognitivism and offered rejection of neural reductionism. Embodiment in social science can also imply a process of acquisition of tacit knowledge and techniques which are often required through repetitive training and experience or education under the lens uh, apprenticeship. This is embodied knowledge. So such embodied knowledge is a crucial property, not only for craftsmanship, but also in producing artistic work, such as drawing. Uh, Professor Nagai will discuss the relationship between the developing process of human cognition and the drawing skill today. The computing uh, of artificial intelligence and art has become common reproduction process and both its limitations and the potentials have been discussed for many decades. The computer art, especially algorithmic art, brings about an interesting challenge. For example, an algorithm today can capture Van Gogh style and apply it an arbitrary photograph. One of the most fascinating attempts in this trend is trying the transfer embodied knowledge of human artists into a machine, particularly a robot platform, robotic platform. So focusing on proprioceptive pro pro feedback uh, for the task at hand, uh, the project tried to emulate the principle of human drawing skill. This project has been de developed by one of our speakers today, Professor Le Mali and his uh, research group. Biologically inspired robotics seeks to abstract the general principle of mechanism to apply to the design of the useful artifact. As a robot, can be understood as a practical alternative tool, or that it becomes more methodological thinking device, not only uh, traditional robotics, but also for the other fields such as biology, medicine, or design. In particular, this sort of robot, robot, this robotics can be contributed to the design field. Um, robot for drawing machine, however, not just a methodological thinking tool, but platforms to execute the principle of human drawing skill. The former aims to extract principle from biological system, but the latter attempt to transfer principle, principle to embodied knowledge into a robot. The, the expected uh, achievement then are different, uh, but for both, however, using a robot, physical body as a tool or part of their methodology can be viewed as the same approach. For both, materiality of the body is an important element to conduct their project. Here, we need to further consider the meaning and the validity of having a body as a device, a platform for exploring future developments of artificial intelligence. More precisely, in what ways can robotics, you know, robotics give rise to the interplay between nature biology and culture or technology and help to develop uh, the assemblage of embodied knowledge and machine. In the social science, there have been critical review of biological determinism since they consider intelligence is developed not only the biological, uh, but also by the social. At the same time, we cannot disregard biology and technology since human intelligence is the biosocial 
As long as we are body in social life, we cannot separate our material body from both biology and the social. For the third seminar, uh, we invite researchers, Professor Fumina Ida from University of Cambridge, who is working on biologically inspired robots, and Professor Yuki Nagai from University of Tokyo, who is developing a neural network model for robots to investigate social cognitive development. And Professor Frederick Leima Lee, uh, who is developing drawing robots from Goldsmith University of London. So we all, uh, you know, and we also invite a uh, discussant, Japanese leading design engineer and uh, gifted illustrator, uh, Professor Shunji Yamanaka from the Tokyo University. Right, so the so first speaker I want to introduce, uh, Fumiya Ida. He's a professor of robotics at the Development Engineering, University of Cambridge, the director of Bio-inspired robotics and the deputy director of EPSRC, Center of Doctoral Training in Agri Agri-Food Robotics. His research interests include biologically inspired robotics, embodied artificial intelligence, and bio mechanics, uh, where he was involved in a number of research projects uh, related to dynamic leg locomotion, dexture, dexture uh, adaptive manipulation, human-machine interactions, and evolutionary robotics. So he has a lot of award, the 2006 uh, fellow, the fellow of uh, prospective research uh, from the Swiss National Science Foundation and 2009 uh, Swiss National Science Foundation professorship for assistant professor at ETH Zurich. Uh, he was also recipient of the IROS 2016 Fukuda Yang Professional Award, Royal Society Translation Award 2017, University of Tokyo Social uh, so Science Award 2021. His title uh, paper, today's title is Bio-Inspired Soft Robotics and AI Toward Embodied Intelligence. Okay, so now I can give you my microphone to Fumia. Okay, uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, Dr. Tamari, can you hear me okay and you see my screen? Yeah, fine. Thank Excellent. you. Excellent. Yeah, well, thank you very much for uh, inviting me to this very exciting uh, workshop today. Uh, and uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Tamari san, organizing this um, in the first place. And uh, I'm very honored to give this first talk today. Uh, about um, this embodied intelligence and I have a very long title uh, of my presentation today but uh, the main message is that how we can connect uh, biology robotics AI all together uh, in order to understand and research embodied intelligence and uh, as uh, uh, Tamari says, uh, described, I think this is really exciting, but also important research area to understand uh, even further insight into our society of human society, as well as the technologies uh, included. Um, so that's a kind of topic I'm you know, really excited, interested in, and I would like to uh, share some of the ideas that we have been discussing uh, in our research community of robotics and AI. Okay, so let me get started uh, with the uh, first introductory video. Uh, hopefully you can see this video of a bipedal dog uh, called the Faith. Um, so this is a uh, a video of the dog, very famous dog actually in the community of the leg locomotion researchers, uh, because there has been always a big debate uh, about whether uh, four leg animals can ever walk and run with two legs. Uh, but here is the living uh, proof that the animals can actually adapt to a significant change of the um, um, significant change of the design. And this is a, a really uh, exciting as well as um, very um, disappointing from my point of view because our robots are never ever able to uh, adapt in such a significant change of the uh, design. And uh, this is ultimately uh, our goal of, um, of a research, like how we can build the robot in the same similar level of adaptability to animals. So we can still learn a lot from uh, our, um, our uh, mother nature. 
So <clears throat> um, in order to achieve this kind of adaptability, I think there's something wrong with the way how we think and build our uh, artificial intelligence systems. Uh, and uh, the old uh, problem is actually starting from this, as Tamarison uh, in the, in explained at the beginning. So uh, we usually think or um, educate it to understand our intelligent behaviors as the outcome of uh, our thinking or brain uh, information processing. Um, and uh, this is uh, uh, in our field called the good old fashioned AI or uh, also known as a GoFi approach. So uh, we usually think that the intelligence is coming from our brain or controller or computer, whatever you think. Um, but the idea is that we get information from the task or environment. This is a sensing part. And then the brain does the, all the information processing and uh, before uh, taking actions um, as a, uh, uh, giving back to the um, environment interactions. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, this has a lot of lots of pro uh, problems uh, because the thinking is, of course, a very important process for our intelligent um, uh, processes. But at the same time, it ignores a lot of lots of important things in between uh, controller and uh, and the and brain and the environment, which is actually the embodiment part. So in, instead of thinking uh, about too much about thinking, uh, we need to look at something uh, in between. And that's the uh, uh, field, um, uh, field of embodied intelligence. So what we are thinking about is instead of uh, thinking too much of information processing in our brain or computer, uh, we need to really think about what's in between of the information processing and our physical environment, which is the body dynamics, the body morphology, um, a lot of mechanical, physical features uh, of uh, um, agents to be included uh, in the discussion of intelligent adaptive behaviors. And here we actually have a very high level abstraction of function in our body. So we have roughly something about the mechanical system, including bones, skeletons, um, muscles, and skins, and hairs, and everything like that. Uh, but also we have a significant amount of sensor system, which it has also mechanical features, which often are ignored in the uh, GoFi framework. So the sensor system has also a lot of mechanical features that influence the way how we look at uh, uh, how our brains and computers uh, look uh, at the uh, physical environment. Uh, but that part is also um, a, a big um, component of embodied intelligence. So roughly speaking, I'm not gonna go too much into details of these uh, figures, uh, but roughly speaking, what we are interested in is how we can understand this middle layer of a physical embodiment, uh, which uh, is influencing the way how we humans, animals, and other ro adaptive robots can be more intelligent and adaptive. Uh, and that's the main topic of, uh, of today's lecture. So uh, how can we understand such a middle layer of, uh, of embodied intelligent agents? And that's uh, uh, one of the first things we want to uh, discuss here. So uh, the first um, example from nature I want to show is the growth uh, and the learning process of a biological uh, agent. So here is the, a kind of recent um, uh, development in the developmental science, especially how body and the brain grow together, uh, so that uh, especially before the birth of, uh, of a human. So uh, here is the illustration, the green part of this uh, uh, figure shows that the, uh, the brain cells uh, and everything else is also uh, included in this picture. So we actually see that uh, even from the very beginning of our life in the week three, we have uh, already the brain cells and the body uh, um, put together in a very small, tiny organism. Uh, but then we grow over many, many weeks, um, uh, including brain and body together. Uh, so, uh, and, uh, and even before the birth of our body. So this process is really, really important to think about because 
actually brain is, you know, brain and body are not just put together uh, after we are born, uh, but they grow together in order to dip, uh, in order to these two parts and two components of our body uh, put together um, little by little so that they are nicely coupled and uh, cooperate to each other. So that's something I, I just want to start with an inspiration from nature, how we can actually make our body uh, grow over time um, um, in, uh, from the beginning. Um, and uh, <clears throat> so, uh, but on the other hand, what's really uh, the challenging uh, for roboticists, the robotics engineers uh, learning from nature uh, is that the complexity challenge. So our body is incredibly complicated. If you look at the you know, X axis, the body complexity, Y axis, task complexity, you know, humans are actually very, very useless at the beginning, especially before birth or you know, before teenager, they cannot really do much. And our robots can actually do quite a lot of things uh, compared to um, uh, small uh, children. But, uh, but at the same time, uh, robots are not able to grow too much like uh, humans or other animals. Uh, and, uh, and we always get stuck at the, a certain level of complexity of body. And therefore what robots can do today, it's really, it's really limited compared to what humans and other animals can do. So, my question uh, for our students of robotics or you know, the future students of robotics, how we can bring our robots um, moving uh, more toward the complexity of humans or other animals in terms of body complexity, as well as task complexity, right? So that's a kind of uh, the big vision of uh, our robotics research in the next hundred years or so. Um, and. Um, how can we think about complexity, right? So that's not the easy uh, question and we still need to think about it, but uh, you know, complexity can be considered as a number of uh, motors, a number of sensors, or number of body parts, degrees of freedoms, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, but also it's not only just number of uh, components, right? The complexity can also mean something about the growth process, self-healing process, um, how we can increase the life expectancy, social interactions, and so on. So this complexity um, is, uh, is kind of really, really uh, uh, not comparable uh, if we look at biological systems. Um, and the tax complexity. So our robots are able to do a lot of incredible things, sometimes you know, very fast and precise pick and place operations in factories and so on. Uh, but that's, uh, that's not complex enough compared to our biological counterparts living in un unconstrained nature. And that's another thing we need to think about, how we can increase the task complexity um, in, in, the, um, in the natural environment. And that's something we still not uh, have any idea how we can solve such a problem. So the complexity, the keyword I want to uh, uh, discuss with you today, and uh, that's something uh, we want to um, um, introduce uh, some of our research project toward that goal. So uh, in order to increase the body complexity in the first instance, I think that's one of the things we uh, are really interested in. So the body complexity has to come with soft body. Uh, so most of our robots are built by uh, rigid bodies, but if you look at nature, uh, most of our body uh, components are built out of uh, soft substances. So this is an example of octopus uh, moving through um, uh, a narrow passage. And uh, uh, this, rope, uh, this animal is able to uh, go through really, really narrow uh, environment because uh, it has a very soft components in the, uh, in the body. So the, the, the hardest um, uh, body components is the eyeballs and everything else is soft and there's not even uh, a skeleton inside. So, um, um, and that's really the, uh, the um, interesting aspect of, of, uh, of uh, our, our body. And even for human beings, like 80 or 90% of our body components, uh, uh, including, um, you know, the heart, lungs, uh, tissues, um, and the skins and hairs, most of our body components are soft. And that's something we need to uh, think about how we can make our robots with soft components. So uh, one of the approaches that we can think about is how we use the soft materials for um, 
uh, robot, uh, um, uh, 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 the robot executing tasks. And one really good example of this kind is the so-called universal gripper. Uh, this video is um, showing one of the uh, uh, examples of uh, universal gripper made in Cornell University about uh, 10 years ago. So this robot is made out of balloons. So the robot end effect, like a hand part, is made out of a balloon and filled with the uh, particles inside. Uh, so when the balloon is inflated, the, uh, it is able to uh, pick up, uh, it is able to adapt to any shapes that it is physically in contact with. Uh, but then uh, as soon as you have a contact with ob ob objects, uh, you can apply some vacuum so that you can pressurize the contact part of the object. So this is the kind of a really interesting instance in the softness plays a very important role for the adaptive uh, robot. So in this case, uh, materials has a uh, really um, in intelligence such that you can actually uh, have a very nice interaction with the environment. So um, the interesting thing about this robot is that the robot doesn't really have a brain here, right? What the brain is doing is on and off the, um, the balloon uh, with the uh, vacuum um, uh, uh, valve. And that is actually able to uh, already grasp so many different kind of things. Uh, um, and that, that's a really good instance how soft materials can give an intelligent adaptive behaviors. If you look at the little more details of how the universal gripper works, so if you look at the universal gripper, here is a balloon part, and this is the circular ob object that is trying to grasp. So the idea here is that soft materials can actually adapt to the uh, shape of the object. And uh, um, this adaptation of the shape is very important to uh, increase the friction force or suction uh, force uh, so that you can grasp the object, right? Uh, and if you want to know how much force this grasping force is, you have uh, actually quite complex equation that shows the uh, relationship between suction force and friction force. But on the, on the other hand, this robot doesn't need to know all this equation, right? What robot needs to do is on and off the, uh, um, the grip bar with the uh, vacuum uh, pump. Uh, and then all this uh, um, equation comes by itself uh, because of the interaction with the soft surface and the object. So the adaptation of the body shape to the object is a very important uh, feature uh, mechanism of the universal gripper and the soft body in general. So this is kind of illustration that, uh, um, you know, uh, if we have rigid robots that need to grasp so many different objects, we need a sensor and control and thinking about how to build, uh, how to uh, grasp object. But here, materials can uh, replace all of these uh, processes that the computers might, uh, would have to do uh, otherwise. And uh, that's a really illustration of how embodiment can uh, improve the complexity of the uh, intelligent adaptive behaviors otherwise. And there are many, many, many examples of soft robots that we uh, can introduce potentially here. Uh, and many robots are made out of a mini um, a com complex body, uh, deformable objects. And if you want to do something like a climbing robot like this, soft material plays an important role because uh, the soft materials and the stickiness to the environment, like uh, adhesion, are uh, related to each other. So the material level um, thinking is very important for robots to be adaptive in, uh, in a complex environment like this. I would also like to uh, emphasize what is the, um, um, the research mm -hmm. challenge at the moment. So this is one of our research projects at the moment. So soft materials is good to have in the robots, but at the same time, uh, it's, it's, uh, it gives us additional problems of design uh, complexity. So we need to think about the materials to be integrated for um, a complex a system and environment interaction. So in this particular example, we're showing uh, that the use of a multi-material uh, 3D printing technology. So this is a really interesting uh, tool, research tool, because we can make a more like a biological uh, a structure. So here is examples that the uh, soft materials and rigid materials are 3D printed in one go. 
uh, but then we can actually have a many complex design parts like a, a, a rigid um, a bone structure as well as soft ligaments and tendons and that can be connected that can be printed to each other so we can make a nice uh, deformable structure like this but at the same time we don't want to have a homogeneous structure like a conventional robots we want to have a heterogeneous uh, softness, for example, in the thumb joint in our uh, hand uh, plays a very important role in the piano playing like this, uh, because when you're pressing the key, you want to have a rigidity, but if you want to shift the hand on the side where you want to have a softness on, this, uh, on the uh, horizontal direction, and that kind of heterogeneity in the body structure uh, softness uh, is a uh, is next challenge, how we can design such a thing. And the design process is not easy for such a complex systems. And that's what we are also in exploring in our research uh, projects. So uh, hopefully we can build the uh, 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 robots like, um, like our hands uh, so that we can nicely play a piano, not just you know, pressing keys on and off, but we can also do the expressive um, uh, piano playing in the future. So um, just to give a, a bit of summary about what is the soft robotic revolution at the moment, right? So the soft robot, there are many, many, many researchers in this field in our community. We have about thousand members in the soft robotics uh, community. Uh, but what we are uh, collectively um, trying to solve is the robot intelligence at the material level. So um, because our robots are made out of, or we used to made out of really rigid materials, we could not go uh, too much complex body structure. But because we are now dealing with the material level intelligence, we can have a um, more like a, um, biological um, uh, cells. Uh, we have uh, functional materials, deformable materials. We can integrate many sensors and motors together. Uh, and. Uh, uh, and that's what we are trying to do with the soft functional materials. And hopefully we can make um, a more complex, uh, uh, we, can able, we can make a ro complex robot that is able to do the complex um, uh, task uh, in complex environment. And that's what we are doing with the soft robotic uh, revolution. So this is a really good um, um, uh, the foundation of a technological basis that we have a new materials, new way of designing uh, complex robots. But the next is how we can put them all together. And that's uh, uh, something we want to discuss next. So, um, so this is again, um, the examples from uh, nature. So this is the human cell differentiation process. Uh, the uh, the slides borrowed from uh, uh, Professor uh, John Garden from the University of Cambridge. So he's always saying in, the, um, in his um, uh, lecture that the, the most exciting aspects of um, biology is this scalability of our life, you know, starting from one cell all the way up to the bag of cells, the 10 to the 13 cells uh, when we become adult. Uh, and most of the things are happening before birth, um, and they have a lot of, lots of, lots of interesting processes going on uh, before we are born. But after we are born, we grow about a thousand times. Uh, and then the important thing is we have many different kinds of cells in our body, uh, starting from brain, skin, blood, and, and internal organs, and so on. Uh, so that's one aspect of it. And another aspect of it is that our body is highly, highly dynamic. Right? Our body is exchanging about 100 million cells every minute. So by the time I finish my talk, I'm going to be a completely different person as a joke. Um, but on the other hand, um, another important in fact, that uh, we need to think about is the amount of information necessary to uh, to make all the complex process happen. So we uh, we know something like seven hundred megabyte or one gigabyte of information uh, in human genome, uh, and that's all we need to make all the scalable complex process happens. And um, um, and that, that is equivalent to basically one bit of uh, like genome information is in charge of a design of uh, almost 1800 cells. And uh, that's, that's really incredible, right? So the, the genome itself is not telling too much about 
uh, our design, but it's uh, it's it's really the collaborative process with the um, uh, physical interaction with the environment. So um, what we need to think about is that how all the uh, growth process in the uh, self-organization uh, rules. So there are lots of lots of important things we learn from a biological self-organization, how we can do the scalability, right? So the scale, our body never be put together by our mothers, uh, but actually the self-organization process happening in the body of, uh, of our mothers. Uh, so we never we should not you know, build our robots manually in the future if we want to go complexity. Uh, we need to really think of the growth and the uh, growth process rather than build assemble by hand. Uh, we also need to think about how morphological diversity and emergence of function to think about, right? So this uh, it's not just one kind of cells doing uh, everything, but it, it differentiating into many different kind of shell, uh, shape uh, um, um, functions. And then finally, the, the coupling with the environment. So um, uh, the environment has to be included in the, all the, the developmental process and in interactions, and that's something uh, we need to think about. So how can we build the robots in, uh, in this kind of new way uh, inspired from nature? And that has been um, uh, our research topic for last um, uh, 10 or 15 years. Um, and uh, one of our approaches um, that we're taking in, employed in our research project is that we call this robot genome uh, model, that the robot is not built by humans, but the robot has to be developed in the, um, in the developmental and ev evolutionary process. So uh, there's some information source like a robot genome, uh, that is the starting uh, point of the whole uh, process. But then this robot genome is uh, phenotyped into uh, robots, some physical robots, right? So then the, the robot is acting and evaluated from some selection process. And then this robot has to be put back into the genome. So this is what the cell, dif cell differentiation is happening in our body. Uh, and that is, should be the, the, uh, the first principle of the robots to, uh, to be built uh, and developed in the future. The most important thing is that we have a, um, a physical uh, system. This is shown by Red. Uh, this robot itself is a physical entity because it has to interact with the physical environment. But at the same time, uh, there's information elements. So the genome has a design information that uh, work together with the environments to make a robots to be uh, physically built. So the going back and forth between the information world and the physical world is kind of really important uh, feature of this robot uh, genome model and how, how we can do such a uh, process like self-organization of a robot design and robots uh, evaluation process. And that's one of the, uh, the central questions we have been uh, exploring in the last, uh, last decades. So it sounds like a really complex process, but I think we can actually do, do it in many different ways. So what we have uh, tried is that uh, we basically uh, define a, a process, the model robots, the concept of model robots, um, uh, mediating between the transition between genome information world and the physical robot world. Uh, and and uh, that's one of the things we, um, the, the developmental efforts we put in the last decade. So the mother robot, what does it mean mother robots? So the mother robot looks like this one. So here is a video, hopefully you can see the video. This robotic arm uh, has a, some specialized end effector that is able to the 3D print it, like making a physical structure like this. Uh, and then uh, the robot uh, is, uh, is not only 3D printing, but it's also uh, able to do pick and place and assembling uh, structure. So this uh, robot is using the material called the thermoplastic adhesives, uh, also known as a glue gun. Um, and that this material is not used not only for 3D printing, but also being able to assemble and connect uh, things together. So here's the example, robot is able to make uh, different kinds of shapes and the structures and put them together as an end effect, right? So this robot is able to create its own end effector uh, by designing um, this, uh, by using this uh, thermoplastic adhesives. 
So this is a really interesting process because the robot is mechanically uh, is able to mechanically change its own body for different tasks. And that's really, really interesting first step that robot can be adaptive in the mechanical sense rather than um, uh, the information processing sense. Uh, but of, of course, you know, at the, at the moment, all of the shapes are designed by humans. So this robot is able to make this uh, uh, structure by, them, by itself. Uh, but the design is given by humans, right? So now the question is how uh, robots can design its own body uh, by itself. So that's uh, the next challenge we try. So uh, the, the next step we made and the, the second version of uh, a mother robot is like this. It's a little more complicated, but it's able to um, uh, pick and place more uh, variations of jacks. So in this case, we actually a robot is able to pick up some of the uh, objects uh, on the table, and then they can use the same glue that the, the, the thermoplastic adhesives to put together, uh, and the robot is able to make a significantly more complex structure, right? So in this case, robot is able to make a, a robotic modules together. So the mother robot is actually making uh, many, many child robots, uh, and that's the kind of base technologies that we developed at the beginning. So then the next question is how this robot is able to use all the skills to make uh, robots moving, uh, uh, making a complex evolutionary process, right? We want to try and errors, many, many different structures so that robot can able to learn what is the good design, what are the bad designs and keep the good design for the improvement. Uh, and that's what we did in this experiment. So the robot actually have a genome structure that is including the construction process of child robots. Uh, and then this robot, the mother robot can make it about 10 robots in one generation of the uh, optimization process, and then measure the, uh, the distance of the lo uh, uh, locomotion so that the robot is able to see which is good design, which is bad design. And then just keep the good design and uh, uh, replicate this good design with some modifications so that we can make a second generation, third generations, and so on and so forth. So this is the uh, experiment with a hundred different design of a child robots uh, and, uh, and trying to improve the design by try and error processes. So here are some examples of, I hope we can see the video. So this is the robots that made by this mother robot. Uh, at the beginning of evolutionary process, uh, you usually have a smaller robot like this, right? Uh, so this robot is able to move a little bit, but it cannot move too far. And that's why uh, it, it actually has to extinguish, uh, extinct in the process of evolution. But the, uh, when we go uh, keep going with the evolutionary process, uh, this mother robot is able to come up with a more complex robot like, like this one. So there's more uh, parts put together so that it can do the longer uh, distance of locomotion and so on. So this is really, really exciting to see these robots are not uh, made by humans, but the robot designing a robot uh, by uh, through the try and error process. And uh, we did a lot and lots of experiments. This mother robot is able to produce 500 robots in one month. Uh, and uh, that is a kind of uh, the large scale experiment we did. Uh, and, uh, uh, and this is a kind of tool so that we can learn what's the embodied intelligence uh, can be uh, self-organized uh, from the try and error process. And that's what we uh, try to understand in this evolutionary robotics project. Um, we, we are doing a lot of different kind of projects right now. So one of them is the 3D printing and the mother robot together. So how the mother robots can make more um, the morphological variations in this kind of experiment. So here, here we have a soft deformable materials included in child robots so that we can do a more interesting interaction with the environment. Uh, and hopefully you can see more advanced robots in the, in the near future. So I just want to conclude my uh, presentation. So I, we introduced a lot of different kinds of things in you know, soft robotics and uh, optimization algorithm and uh, evolutionary algorithms and so on. 
But in the end, what we really want to dis, uh, uh, discuss with you is how the embodied intelligence comes into uh, uh, come together with the technologies of soft robotics and AI. Uh, so body is really the very important, in interesting uh, source of intelligence. And uh, that's something we need to understand in the near future. So, um, and at the moment, we our robots are still um, very simple compared to um, compared to biological systems. But I think this is a direction we are going in the long term, uh, and we need to work on the material level intelligence and uh, uh, some design optimization uh, uh, algorithms, and that's something we need to understand. Uh, but then we can bring this embodied intelligence research to the next uh, level in the near future. Um, obviously, we have uh, lots of collaboration, uh, collaborators and sponsors in this project, and uh, I'd like to thank uh, all of these um, um, collaborators make uh, uh, us possible to do all this research, and especially Lucius Broadback is the person who, uh, who led this evolutionary robotics, uh, um, and uh, that was a really, really collaborative uh, pro um, uh, pro um, uh, uh, research project in, in recent years. Uh, and uh, thank you very much uh, again for uh, uh, Dr. Tamari to organize this event and inviting me for introduction. Uh, and uh, if I don't have much time to explain, but uh, uh, if you're interested in more technical details, please come send me email or come to our website um, uh, on the, um, in the internet. Um, with this, I'd like to stop my presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Professor Ida. Um, well, fantastic sort of, it's, it's really interesting, uh, most advanced bio-inspired uh, soft robotics project. And I think, you know, these projects show uh, that both robotics and biology uh, inspired each other to produce further for the understanding, understanding of both mechanism of robotics as well as that of biology. And we can see analyzing embodiment, uh, physical, uh, having a physical body is essential for uh, understanding intelligence. And I just wonder, you know, mother robot you talked about, you know, who, who, who is mother of mother robot? <laughs> it's perhaps <laughs> still human, <laughs> I guess. Okay, so we just moved to a second speaker. Uh, for today's, we have three speakers. The second one, uh, Yukie Nagai. Uh, Yukie Nagai is a professor, uh, project professor at the International Research Center for Neurointelligence at the University of Tokyo. And her research interests include cognitive development robotics, computational neuroscience, and assistive technology for the developmental uh, disorders. And her research achievements have been widely reported in the media as novel uh, techniques, techniques to understand and assist the human cognitive development. And she was uh, selected to 30 women in robotics you need to know about in 19, 2019 and world 50 most known uh, women in robotics in 2020. Oh, she serves as a principal investigator of CREST, uh, Cognitive Mirroring, and CREST, uh, Cognitive Feeling, since 2016 and 2021, respectively. Yes, so, yes, please, uh, Professor Nagai, get start, started, please. Dr. Tamari, thank you very much for kind introduction and uh, for giving me this great opportunities to present our latest research achievement. I hope you can see my slide. Is it everything okay? I hope, okay, thanks. So uh, what I'm going to talk to you today is about their developmental diversity in drawing. The idea here is that their uh, drawing is an embodied activities especially the children have to learn in their early their development. And then that we utilize the robotic technologies to better understand the underlying mechanism of their child drawing development. 
And they also they're related to their embodied their, uh, intelligence, the embodiment of the robot. Uh, I have to first admit that there, my research is more about the information processing. If you remember Humia's talk, the Humia showed the three layered their uh, embodied intelligence. The top layers is called information processing, which is corresponding to their brain for the human. And the middle is their body. And the third layer is their environment. The, my research is mainly focusing on the information processing in the top. But however, as Humia mentioned, the information processing, the brain has to interact with the environment through the body. And then the, this embodied interaction plays an important role in shaping our brain, the brain. So the question is, what kind of neural mechanism would enable robots to acquire the drawing abilities as children also acquire? And then we have recently uh, found out that the neuroscience cell called predictive coding uh, seems to play an important role in explaining the human intelligence. So I'd like to share our very latest uh, research achievement showing how the robot and the child can acquire the embodied the drawing behaviors. So the drawing is an embodied activity, as I said. Here, the important thing is that when child draw a picture, we can see how children perceive the world and also how they want to act on the world. Their information processing in the human brain cannot be directly assessed. Even using the neural imaging technique, it's very hard to understand what informations are really processed in the brain. And then the, we thought that the drawing can be a great window to see through their human their information processing in the brain. And we utilize that drawing as a task, both for children and robots to compare how and what their neural mechanism would enable both children and robots to acquire that drawing abilities. Here are some of their examples from the child study. We know that their human children gradually develop their drawing abilities with age. For example, these are some examples like drawing the chair at four years, five years, six, and so on. So as they develop, you can also see that their, their drawing abilities becomes more uh, accurate and more precise. For example, their cup started with just a square at four years old, but then he or she gradually added more details so that, that it can better represent the cup. Another example, the phone also started with a just a square, but then the more detailed information are gradually added with age. And not only this kind of the quantitative, there are differences in the drawing behaviors, but the qualitative findings plays a very important role in understanding the child perce perceptions. Here, you can see some examples of the child drawing. Children were asked to draw a child. And then these are some examples drawn by the uh, young children. And here, I want you to uh, focus on these three examples. These are very typical and also very interesting example. You can see that they, they drew, drew the face, and then the face is directly connected with legs or arms. So there is no torso the body trunk here. We think that this drawing can tell us what is more important for children. In this case, the face is more important in the social interactions in children. That may be why children draw mainly the face in more details and no torso, just the legs and the arms, which are also plays an important role in the social interactions. And this is an example showing the developmental change, the improvement in the younger age. But what about the individual diversity? Some researchers investigated what differences in drawing behaviors can be observed between the typically developed children and atypically developed children, like in children with autism spectrum disorders. These are an example. There are uh, illustrations by the children with ASD. For example, they, they are asked to draw a uh, house. 
as in showing that example. But then interestingly, one child started drawing a window, door, and the next window. And finally, he added the contours of the house. If you are asked to draw a house, I think that most of you start drawing the contour of the house, starting with the outline and then adding the more details inside. This the opposite, the ordering of the drawing can also tell what is more important for the SD children. Or another type of SD children had difficulties in finding the structure in the house. He or she put the window or doors, not in a structured way, but in the order in this way. But interestingly, that children with autism spectrum disorder does not always show such difficulties in drawing. Sometimes some children show superior ability in drawing. The light most showing an example, their Nadia, she it was their, uh, diagnosed as an autistic savant. The savant often have the very specific, special abilities in math or art. And this girl at the five years old drew a, like a very, very professional their picture like this which also suggesting that the person with ASD seems to have the abilities to more, to focus and look at the more details of the object. And we wondered what neural mechanism may produce this kind of developmental change and also the individual diversity. And to address this research question, we took the two fold approach. One is the computational modeling, we developed their bio-inspired neural, ne neural network model for robots so that the robots can learn to draw the picture like children. And then we compare this result from the computational modeling with the human child drawing. And you can see that the, how their uh, developmental diversity and the individual differences can be explained by the computational model. So what is the research question here again? Our key research question is to find out a unified principle for cognitive development, not only the drawing, but also many types of cognitive abilities, like in communication, social interaction, and so on. And here, the important thing is that the development is not just a simple, like an immaturation, the processes but it also includes their individual diversity, as I said. And then we are wondering whether there is a unified principle that can account for both the developmental improvement and the developmental individual diversity between the typical and atypical development. So what's the neural principle that can account for such a very complex developmental processes? And then we found out that some neuroscientists have been suggesting that the predictive processing in the human brain seems to play the important role in the many cognitive abilities, at least in adults. The predictive coding cell lead suggests that the human brain works as a predictive machine. The human brain perceives the sensory signal through the body we can observe the environment through the eyes, ears, and so on. Such as sensory signals are fed into our brain, but our brain does not simply rely on the sensory signal, but we develop the internal model, which stores the knowledge and experiences. And through this internal model, we make the predictions about the world. What kind of signal would be coming into our brain? This is a prediction. And then our brain tries to integrate this top-down prediction signal and the bottom-up sensory signal to minimize the prediction error, either by updating our internal model or by changing the world. Here, the important thing is that not only the perceptual process, but also the process of action generations can be explained by the process of minimization of prediction error. Our body provides their proprioceptive sensations to the brain and then the brain also makes a prediction about the proprioceptive signal, which is in the body state. And then there, if we can see the top down, there are some differences between the top down prediction and the bottom up sensation. The motor output is modified in order to minimize the prediction error, which result in their motor behaviors. 
And additional important idea here is that this process to integrate the top-down prediction and bottom-up sensations seems to obey the Bayes cell level. Here, the sensory signal is considered as a light wavefront, and the top-down prediction plays a multiplier. And based on the acuity of two, these, two, two, these two signals, the human brain integrates the signal to perceive the world. In case of typical development, the sensory signal and the top-down predictions have a good balance, so that our perception relies both on the sensory signal and the top-down information. But in case of autism spectrum disorder, who often have their hypersensory sensitivity, seems to have very uh, worse their acuity in the prior predictions. That may be why they more strongly rely on their sensory incoming signal which is so-called hypoplier hypothesis for ASD. So we started with this uh, neuroscience theory to uh, investigate to what extent the developmental diversity can be explained by this predictive coding method. So first I'd like to show you our robotic study, which develops their neural network model based on the predictive coding. Here is the scenario for the robot experiment. We designed their uh, interaction scenarios where their human caregivers first draw a part of part of the picture, and then Robert perceive this input signal and then infer what is the intended picture of this person. And then their inference, which is also uh, produced by the prediction error minimizations, allows the Robert to produce their. Uh, missing parts of these pictures, and then add their uh, complete their pictures. For example, the, in this case, um, sorry. sorry. Sorry that it takes a little bit of time, but in the radar, we can, you can see what is their picture is drawn here. So then the, to achieve this goal, our goal, uh, we have designed a neural network model based on the predictive coding. Here we are extending the typical, the recurrent neural network model with, with the idea of the Bayesian based predictive coding. As you may know, the recurrent neural network model has a function to predict the next time step signal based on the current time step signal. And their context radio works as a kind of the memory which stores the history of the incoming signal. And here, the one important extension is that the network predicts not only the mean of the signal, but also the variance of the signal, which corresponding to their uh, acuity, the precision of their predicted signal. And these two signal, mean and variance, are fed into the Bayesian inference module, which integrate their incoming sensory signal and top-down prediction to produce the posterior of the uh, base inference. And the important point here is that we modify, we can modify this network parameter so that we can simulate like a typically developed network or a typically developed networks. And then we hypothesize that by modifying the prior precision responding here, the prior precision, we can simulate their individual diversity, which are observed in the autistic children. In the previous the existing hypothesis, the researchers hypothesized that the hypoplier, which have their very high the, uh, variance for the prior predictions, produces their hypersensitivity in autism. But then they might, our, the new the hypothesis, extended hypothesis suggests that not only hypoplier, but also hyperplier, which is another extreme of this predictive coding, may explain another type of autism spectrum disorder. So what happens if we modify that mod this kind of the model parameter for learning? In order to check the hypothesis, we designed a drawing experiment as I showed in the video. We first trained the network using these six third target patterns, and then after training, their network was given only a part of the trajectory, only the one third of the trajectories. For example, in case of face, 
only the contour of face was given to the network, and then network was asked to infer the intended pattern and then continue our and adding their missing parts. The trajectory looked like this. The first, the contours is drawn like this, and then after their input signal stops, the network starts predicting the missing parts, which is now expressed by the green lines. If the training is well are conducted, the network can properly predict the desired patterns. So what's happened if we modify the network parameter, which can control the precision of the prior predictions? We utilized the parameter H and then modified it to a very small value in the higher value. First, let's look at their uh, H equals one, which is the normal condition without any modification. In this case, you can see that the network can very well uh, nicely produce the desired pattern, face, house, car, and so on, without so much the confusion or the misunderstanding of the intended pattern. But interestingly, first when we design the parameter with a very low value, which suggesting that the network utilizes a very strong their prior predictions, the network often confused with their similar patterns. For example, you can see that this the face, but this car is also misunderstood as a face because the contour of the face and car were similar to each other. Well, another example is that humans and locates are also confused because their post, uh, the postures or the shape of the human and locate were also close to each other. And then if we modify the parameter into the another extreme, which is very high value for H, we observed that the network often failed in learning their desired patterns. It often showed the scraping patterns like this, which might be also observed in young children. Here is the statistical analysis of the result. We can see the kind of U-shape that error curves, where the uh, normal plier has the lowest our error value, whereas the hyper and hyperplier have larger value caused by the scribbling or confusion between the similar patterns. And then the, as an advantage of using the computational neural network model, we can also more closely analyze the internal representation of the network, not only the behavior of the network. So now we apply the principal component analysis to visualize the internal structure of the network. Here, I would like to show that only the three examples uh, to show how their similar patterns or different that drawing patterns are structured in the network representation. What I want you to focus is the lower part. First, there are uh, normal, the H value. In this case, there you can see that red, yellow, and blue lines are well nicely separated while the yellow and red have small overlaps. The reason here is that face and house are really similar to each other, which have the contours and internal features. So red and yellow, their similarities in this trajectory also indicating that these two patterns are somehow the sharing the internal representation, whereas the flower has very completely different the structure here. And when the network often uh, misunderstood the intended pattern, we could also observe such a misunderstood the reasons in the network. The red and the yellow lines are completely overlapping, which result in their misunderstanding or their uh, mis they shared the representation. And then in case of the network produced the scraping behaviors, the internal representation of the networks are also not structure at all, which is the reason why the network could not uh, complete the missing parts. Here is the robot behavior. You can see that their normal player robots can nicely fulfill the missing parts like this, whereas the hyperplier network uh, start scraping, showing the scraping behaviors in the end. In this way, we can observe that the, how the embodied the interaction with the environment can be observed also in the robot behavior.
Okay, then what happens in children's? How their developmental diversity and also the individual differences can be observed in the child drawing. We conducted a very similar experiment with children uh, whose age are two to eight years old. We collected more than 600 of drawing on the tablet and then analyzed statistically how the diversity and the developmental improvement can be observed. These are just an example. We roughly found there four categories of drawing, like a scribbling behavior, coloring behaviors, and tracing the existing line and the completion. The completion is there uh, to fill the missing parts, like an eyes and mouth for face, or the windows and the wheel for a car. And we first uh, asked an uh, evaluator to rate the completions uh, performances uh, in a subjective way. We had three their conditions, but just for the uh, sake of simplicity, we'd like to focus on the outline condition. We provided only the outline of the picture and then asked children to draw whatever they like. And we found that there, with their age increase, uh, the completion scores also gradually improves as we expect. And the interesting analysis is next one how the differentiations of their different categories are observed in the child drawing. In order to more statistically evaluate this, we introduce the convolutional neural network, which have pre-trained with the natural images. Their pre-trained with natural image means that the network already have some capacity, the abilities to differentiate the different input. So if the child drawings are well differentiated, the network shows a different activity in the higher layer. And this graph shows the distances between the activities of the different input. The lighter color showing the more differentiated, whereas the darker color showing less differentiated. So we can roughly see their uh, individual, sorry, their developmental improvement in the differentiation abilities again, as we expected in the uh, subjective evaluations. And finally, we combined these two uh, evaluation in to see the, how the developmental improvement and the individual diversity can be captured in, based on the predictive coding. Horizontal axis corresponding to the completion score, whereas the, this, uh, the vertical axis corresponding to the similarity score. And the, this, the color dots corresponding to the scraping, coloring, tracing, the completion patterns of the chart drawing. And these are some examples of each category. For example, there are 41 months old infants who draw their scraping patterns always, regardless of the input signals, are categorized here, whereas the uh, tracing or their Complete, sorry, the colorings are located on the top left. And then on top right, you can see that some completion pattern like this. And what we are so much excited with this result is that these two dimensional space are roughly corresponding to the development of the predictive coding. The children start with very low acuity in both perception, their sensation and the predictions. If they can improve their prediction ability, and then their precision of the prediction gets their higher and higher. This their uh, drawing abilities goes from left to right. In contrast, if the sensation abilities improves and the acuity of the sensation becomes higher and higher, this the, their drawing behavior moves from top uh, bottom to top, and then with by combining these two improvement we can see the completion ability like this. This is still a qualitative their, uh, interpretation of their existing result, but we can see the nice correspondences between the developmental improvement and also the individual diversity in this two-dimensional, the predictive coding. So let me conclude my talk. What I'd like to convey in this presentation is that the predictive coding uh, plays an important role in the human information processing. Then that not only the brain develops, but also the body also develops, which is very important in this axis. And then 
I said that the prediction of the precision is are improved as they develop, as they also experience many the different abilities, but also the precision of the sensation improves as they develop. And then the balance between this sensation and predictions and the precision of these two signals are gradually getting higher, seems to play an important role in the typical development. So I want to talk about a little bit more about the sensation, how it can be really achieved in the human children. I summarized two points here, how their embodiment and also the sensory precision plays a role in their cognitive development. First, we know that their human children gradually improve the sensory acuity. And then this the sensation also gradually changes is the precision, not only their brain, but also the body. Sometimes their children's behaviors are very difficult to interpret. So we have to always think about the, how the player and the sensation, this, the balances of these two signals is achieved in the human brain. Not only the precision of player, but also the precision of sensory signals must are gradually improved as they develop. And then from their uh, behavioral study, the, the human children, we know that, the, for example, the human vision, their acuity of the human vision gradually improves as with age. The, for example, the newborns have, uh, have a very blurred image in the beginning. They don't have very clear color yet, but it gradually improves the acuity and also the color information. And we also know from their uh, child-mother interaction study that their body size of the child, the smaller body size of the child plays an important role in simplifying their visual world. Because of the small body, their observation get also limited. But this helps children to find more important information in the world and also more easily associate their incoming sensory signal. So our next step is to integrate these two ideas, not only in their information processing very well, but also the embodied level. When the robot has the real embodied with like in a human child, with the lower acuity or small size, how the perceptual signal, the sensational sensation signal may change their information processing and how they facilitate their predictive coding and learning is our next challenge to address. Thank you very much for your kind attention. And I'd like to especially thank my uh, former colleagues there, Dr. Anya Philipson and the current colleagues, uh, Dr. Cho Tsuji, who mainly worked on this two drawing project. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, that's really fascinating uh, project. Thank you very much, Professor Nagai. Um, it suggests the interaction between the body and the environment can shape the interpretation and the perception of the world. And what is the most fascinating aspect of this project is, of course, application of predictive coding theory in neuroscience to examine development process of child children drawing skills. Well, this is actually a uh, human information processing mechanism. So complex yeah. and also so fascinating uh, area I found. But I think at the same time, this is a sort of prediction. It's sort of, uh, it gets sort of interesting to me uh, because I think this is the kind of, you know, we are all very similar about like a common computer program. You know, you can see the commercial industry such as Amazon recommendation, algorithm. It also predicts future possibilities of consumer behavior, mm -hmm. consumer choices. So what I'm thinking is, you know, these, uh, data is always constantly updating in the pro probabilities of consumer choices. This, um, I think, wants to make a link uh, between second uh, our uh, seminar. We talked about um, digital archive. So data set act as an archive, which can map the past in the present, and it can also predict the future in the present. So, because I think archive with the classification system on the information. So this was one of the topic we discussed in relation to digital archive in the second, uh, in this second seminar of this you know, AI and society. So that's really interesting to sort of link. Thank you very much. Okay, so we just need to move uh, sad uh, final uh, speaker.
Yes, uh, so Frederick uh, for Lemali. Uh, he is a professor of computing department at Goldsmith University of London. He developed area research and teaching in the computing and beyond. beyond. Uh, after launching a new master's art computing in 2004 in Goldsmith, he also contributed to the launch of the first master's in computer game in the greater London area uh, 2008. So this activity is now complemented by um, MA computer game art and design. So he, he explored an area of research bringing together creative artistic activities, vision and perception and understanding with computing. So he's also keen to develop R&D in the entrepreneur, entrepreneurial context. Uh, 2011, he launched London Geometry uh, LTD with Professor William Latham with conduct project focused on interactive visualization, game, science, and art. And also 2015, he launched uh, DIN Icon. How do you pronounce uh, Frederick? Uh, D Y N I A I K O N L T D, together with uh, Professor Stephen Lerger, uh, currently focused on biodiversity, uh, monitoring, and machine learning. Okay, Frederick, uh, please uh, get started with your talk. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Tomoko. Uh, so I've shared my screen, I hope you see it. So I will talk about uh, how art, intelligence and machine can come together. This is gonna be my main goal today. And um, how I will approach that, I will give you some, uh, in part one, my, my talk has two parts. So in part one, I will give more theoretical uh, aspects and some ideas and some critiques of, of current trends. And then in part two, I'll go into some uh, more concrete research projects ongoing, some of them ongoing. So in terms of art, uh, art has, brings up uh, different aspects of uh, human uh, activities uh, and intelligence. And in particular here, I'm emphasizing aspects of creativity, actions. We use our bodies uh, when we create art. Uh, so the embodiment is explicit skills or expertise, we can uh, become better and better as we practice. And we just had an excellent talk mentioning such uh, aspects in the development of our understanding of the world by drawing, for example. It's also a mean of communication, sophisticated communication. It talks about aesthetics, how we appreciate uh, the world and objects in the world. It's important for understanding how humans have developed various representations, in particular of objects, and I'll give some examples soon. And um, it plays an important role in learning about the, the world. And uh, I'm so thankful for the previous speakers as this was uh, well illustrated already. I will give you some uh, definition of intelligence. I will commit myself, uh, hot topic, of course. And what I want to emphasize is aspects of intelligence that makes our species, Homo sapiens, different from other species. And this will relate to art in particular. Along the way, machine uh, plays an important role. And for me, machines goes all the way back to the emergence of tools and the more sophisticated tools of today would be our machines, computers, robots. It also plays an important role in our development uh, as a civil, uh, uh, from the point of view of civilizations as tools and machines are, we can think of them as extensions of our body. So a little more on art and here I'm emphasizing art in a historical perspective, uh, how art emerges in Homo sapiens. Art can be seen as a mode of questioning and inquiry. It elicits our creativity. It's also a very playful way to experiment with our perceptual systems. And again, in a previous talk, we, we had some understanding uh, presented that aspect. It's clearly a mode of embodied actions. And it links with the emergence of human civilization and its continuous evolution. And in order to convince you of that, uh, here's one particular example, but so there are many such examples. Uh, some um, old primitive 
art, visual art, here from the Chauvet cave in France, roughly uh, 30,000 years old. The oldest uh, known um, visual art of that nature is currently put at 45,000 year old. And so if we look at what we know from the origin of Homo sapiens, Homo sapiens is uh, believed to have emerged uh, roughly 2,000 to 300,000 years ago. Um, the oldest form of objects uh, created by uh, Homo sapiens are their tools and as well as uh, what's called rock art, essentially patterns carved into rocks for which we, we find occasionally some examples. Uh, so the oldest ones that we are aware of today are about 100,000 year old. Visual art, we have again, some examples from uh, between 40 and 50,000 years ago. And this is more or less matches uh, what we know about the origin of arithmetics counting, which is done with uh, um, carvings. Uh, so we have uh, uh, traces again from the sort of rock art examples. Much, uh, much later, writing emerges and uh, early forms of writing are actually um, continuation of exploring uh, in the world of visual art. I'll give you an example shortly. And this, we could go like this and see how uh, all these uh, exploration by early humans uh, eventually lead us to uh, create uh, early forms of mathematics, in particular in the Babylonian civilization. So here are just some illustrations of what I'm uh, presenting you from a historical perspective, an example of uh, so-called rock art, some patterns uh, created in rock, uh, roughly 70, here 77,000 uh, years ago. Some early form uh, so-called logograms of symbols uh, which uh, precede the emergence of writing. And on the right hand side, you have uh, a snapshot of evolution of writing mode, which starts with uh, more descriptive forms here in, in tree civilization and eventually reach uh, towards uh, what we call today calligraphy. Moving now from art, uh, description of art and its importance, historically speaking, I want to give you some perspective on uh, what is intelligence. And I'm favoring uh, a definition of intelligence after the uh, proposals of Michael Levin, a bioscientist, and Daniel Dennett, a philosopher, uh, was uh, written a lot about AI in particular. Uh, they have a piece, recent piece called Cognition All the Way Down. And in there, they describe the notion of cognitive horizon as a process of how to detect, represent as memories, anticipate, decide, and crucially attempt to affect our environment. This notion uh, <clears throat> of intelligence is applicable to all cognitive systems. And, and so it's, it's very general and you can apply it to all animals, even to cells. Uh, and then of course, more recently, we could apply this notion to describe levels of intelligence of synthetic life forms and AI. Uh, it has two main dimensions. Uh, so by cognitive horizon, we can think of our impact in space, spatial extent, how far the agent can sense and exert actions in its environment. And there is the time dimension, how far back in memory the agent can uh, relate and how far forward it can anticipate. And this was uh, illustrated in previous talks. So cognitive horizons as a definition of, uh, of intelligence uh, also implicitly necessitate a body. And this is the, uh, uh, the dimension of a spatial dimension to sense and to act. It is, I would argue that it is the main form of intelligence considered today in modern, modern robotics, as well as in current AI. However, in the case of current AI, as Professor Lida emphasized, uh, often there is a neglect today of the role of the body of the agent uh, playing uh, a role in intelligent modes. Now, this is the basis the root, if you want, of what intelligence is about. Uh, yet it doesn't go far enough. And I want to propose you that we need also to consider what makes humans different from other species. 
And so here's a short list of some of the main features that makes us different, different from even our ape, uh, great ape cousins. We early on, uh, all the way back to the early ages of Homo sapiens, developed tools and have kept developing these all the way to uh, current machines. Uh, from very early on, roughly at the same time, as far as we know, uh, from uh, archaeological studies, art, music, and eventually architecture are developed as well. So these activities play a role in distinguishing us from the start from other species. Language is another key aspect. Uh, a bit later, as we saw time-wise, these um, activities uh, combine and lead us to invent writing systems. And we start then therefore having the means to archive knowledge. Later, this will develop into mathematics and eventually all the sciences, all the way today to computing and AI. AI itself, uh, were, emerges not so long ago. Uh, I like to trace its re real scientific beginning to this paper from Alan Turing, famous paper in 1950, in which he proposes the concept of the imitation games, sometimes called the Turing test, in order to have a mean to uh, measure, if you want, levels of intelligence in, in the machines that we develop. And the imitation here refers to the human capacities that a human has. In 1955, the word AI itself, artificial intelligence, is proposed in a famous uh, proposal for a famous symposium that took place a year later. And uh, the notion from Turing there is, is uh, generalized, but uh, still we're talking of simulation. AI and machines, so what I call AIM or art intelligent machines, uh, goes uh, a bit further and argues that in this research agenda, we should uh, also focus more precisely on those activities that make us uh, special as a species. And in my research, I in particular focus on visual art and how it relates to machine uh, with intelligence. So part two of my talk will be uh, some more details on, on this uh, research program. And I will focus on the activity of drawing and its embodiment in robots. So why drawing? Uh, it is an important activity in humans. Uh, it is one of the activities that allows, allows us to explore express and explore human creativity or our creativity. It is process-based, <clears throat> a lot of techniques, a lot of uh, um, dynamics have been developed over, over the ages. Uh, artists develop particular ways of drawing and this became a, a form of knowledge that we have accumulated. And if we understand uh, in discussions with artists how this is uh, conceived, then we can start um, doing science on, on these topics. And I will give you some examples. It is also an activity meant to be appreciated by others than the creators of the art piece. I like to use the word reflexive or reflection to capture that notion. So this calls in, for example, uh, notions of um, uh, perception in particular, how we perceive um, the world and in particular art piece and how we associate value or aesthetics with these art piece. It is shared by, by all and again I won't go in, into detail because we just had a great uh, presentation just before me on, on those aspects. We all learn partly about the world, our environment through drawing activities when we are uh, young. It is also more from a historical point of view, culturally bound. So different styles, for example, will be developed over the ages in, in various cultures and become part of our archive of knowledge and how to represent the world. It is performed via an articulated body. So a clear connection with the embodiment uh, hypothesis of intelligence. And I like to generally think of it as one of the activities that gives us an open window into uh, our mind. 
So what uh, I want to give you uh, some concrete examples of uh, drawing, uh, different type, very different types of drawings, just to illustrate how this is a very rich world to explore from a scientific point of view. Um, of course, there are now hundreds, if not thousands of years of examples of different ways to develop drawing. So here's an example from uh, uh, Pablo Gargallo from Spain, famous artist from visual artist. Uh, here we have an example of sketch, uh, of a sketch. So this is when an artist explores concepts before realizing a more detailed uh, piece in a particular style. And this is uh, really the, the explorative mode, an illustration of how dra drawing relates to exploring ideas. Here's something completely different. So this is in the world of animation, mainly. We also find these representations in the world of dance. Uh, those red lines that you see illustrated are so-called line of actions. These are the first line that an animator will draw on paper. And they give the overall pose and dynamic characteristic of, of the final character. The second technique that's also illustrated here is representation of complex objects by volumetric parts. So you could think of that as a very mathematical approach. This type of technique, so when I say volumetric parts, I mean these sort of cylinders, cones, et cetera, that you see. Uh, this kind of technique is, is also, uh, is actually much older than the line of action and goes back, for example, to Renaissance and even before. And finally, uh, once this is in place here in the context of animation, you would uh, realize your final uh, rendering. Something else again, uh, this is from Pablo Picasso, and this is to illustrate how um, an artist uh, will go through many steps evolving an art piece. You could take each of these panels here and consider it one valuable, interesting final piece. But actually what Picasso is after is what is the essence of the form of a ball of a bull, and uh, you see the, the final rendering at the bottom is, is this conclusion. And this doesn't come out just out of the blue of the imagination of the uh, artist, but actually goes through a lengthy process uh, with feedback uh, provided by the successive uh, evolution of, of ideas uh, done by drawing. And finally, uh, just again for illustrating different types of drawings, here's uh, examples of how to represent movement uh, by, by drawing. Um, this could be used, for example, for a scenario, for dance, uh, um, in theater, etc. And we see uh, techniques, also old techniques, such as the use of stick figures and gesture drawing. So moving on, um, what I will present next uh, in, in part two will be uh, our particular way of approaching one of these uh, ways of representing uh, objects in space via a practical method. So the, the method goes as such. In first, in discussions with an artist or a group of artists, we try to understand the processes that are in, involved in creating a particular type of drawing production. Once we have this in place, then we try to go into the details and break down process processes into more primitive aspects. And this will lead eventually to computational models in terms of routines, algorithms. At that point, we can start producing outcomes, outputs, and test of the validity of our modeling of, of the original processes. Once we're happy with this, we move on to embodiment. We move our computational models from strictly digital outcomes to uh, robotic outcomes, and I'll give you some examples shortly. At that point, we have what I call ground truth, so we can actually test our models with embodied uh, systems. And for example, we use such uh, configurations uh, in collaboration with psychologists, for example. I'll give you some reference later. So the embodiment uh, has been uh, emphasized before as important in understanding human intelligence. I just want to summarize a few more points here. Uh, in our case, uh, robots uh, can also be thought as useful to mimic the human more closely. 
in what I call theatrical performance settings. So we actually can situate uh, our robots in um, activities where humans uh, are observing or sometimes even interacting with the machines. Uh, having robots, and this uh, was emphasized by Professor Lida, also introduce constraints in your actions, in possible actions and possible uh, results, which are not necessarily obvious when you have a purely digital or computational model only. So for example, if you have a robotic arm and you're using it to draw something, well, and if you have a camera that's looking at the drawing, well, the, the robotic arm will get in the way of the, of the camera, of your eye, for example. And this in, imposes some constraint time-wise. And this is typical of what the human has, has to deal with. It also allows us to study and reproduce certain features of uncertainty that lead to a notion of style. And I'll give you very shortly an example of what I mean there. And finally, uh, relating to the, the world of robotics, of course, uh, it adds at uh, the level of thinking of the control and uh, carrying on movement of a potentially complex articulated system, which wouldn't be the case in a purely computational model. So the embodiment hypothesis we've already mentioned, so I don't want to spend too much time on that, but here's sort of a very short statement uh, what it means. Intelligence is in part due and constrained by our body capacities. Um, in the world of art, in particular, the use of tools becomes uh, very important, uh, but also sensing the world, aiming to interfere with it. Intelligence, therefore, is expressed by actions. And furthermore, we can externalize some of our thinking via our artistic productions. And here's a, an example of famous artist Jackson Pollock in so-called action art that he uh, promulgated in the 1950s, where it is clear how the, the body plays an important role in, in the creativity and, and uh, feedback loop that the artist gets. So to be more concrete, uh, I will present uh, to end my talk two main projects. One that took place roughly uh, 12 years, 10, 10 to 12 years ago. This was a collaboration with French artist Patrick Tresset. <clears throat> Patrick uh, was both a, both a computer scientist originally and then left computing and became a visual artist uh, through the 90s in London. And we eventually met in the year 2000, late uh, 2005, 2006. Eventually we worked together and put together a system that uh, was trying to mimic or initially mimic his way of creating portrait. And you see the example of the the result we reach uh, around 2010 on the right, which is what we call Paul the robot. So it is an arm, articulated arm that can hold a pen. Um, and it has also a camera eye that can move around and, and look at the world and find, when it finds faces, it will capture those and then try to render them. So in terms of uh, modeling the processes that the artist is aware of, uh, here's a sort of snapshot quite, quite high level of what these processes imply. And each of these boxes here can then be refined in what I call primitives. The, here's an example of the, the first computational model that we produced or one of the first computational models, one that we were quite satisfied with, which uh, gave us an approximation of outcomes that were similar to the style of Patrick Tresset, using rapid sketchy like gestures to create portraits. However, in this computational model, you can notice that the lines, the rendered lines uh, are very precise, very repetitive. There's some regions where you see that you would guess that this is very likely produced by a machine, not by a human. Uh, so in order to, to go beyond uh, what was possible with the computational model, if you, you remember our method, methodology, we then in, decided to embed these computational models in robotic, uh, robotic systems. And this is how we, we came to create this uh, first version. Uh, the project itself was called ICON, the research project for the automated iconograph. Uh, and again, the robot is called Paul the Robot. So this was first presented in 2010 at an art fair in London called Kinetica. Uh, was very successful in at attracting interest and attention. 
a few, uh, let me see, I think I skipped. Yes, I wanted to show you a short video here that illustrates how, how the robot behaves. So you see here the camera eye looks around, finds a face. You see that the camera, the robot structure is, is vibrating. It's not very rigid. Uh, this relates a little bit to what Professor Lida mentioned. So here, in order to achieve um, line drawings that are human-like, that have the quality of, of the human outcome, uh, we create robots that are not very precise, that have their own uncertainties here through uh, vibrations. And the, the, uh, the impact of that is that each line that's drawn has its unique behavior, unique character. So for example, if Paul the robot would draw uh, the same portrait from the same person, no, uh, the second portrait would not be the same because each line would be different. And this of course is, is a better model for how the human uh, performs and behaves. Yeah, Frederick, uh, we just the time is in concern. So could you do a little bit speed up? Yeah, sure. I, yeah, I'm, I'm going to get there. I'm almost uh, there. So with Patrick, uh, after this work, we started to work, after the, the work you just saw, we, we worked on visual feedback. That is, the camera is now looking at the drawing and is influenced by the drawing as it performs it. So again, getting closer to how the human behaves. And here's an example of more recent work by Patrick, who continues to develop his, his um, system. This is an interactive system where the robot collaborates with the human. It uses some uh, recent uh, machine learning techniques. So you could think of this as machine uh, outcome inspired by uh, initial human inputs. So to, to end my presentation, I want to mention a current ongoing project. What uh, we explored beyond what Patrick just said uh, was able to do was to focus on uh, movement and gestures in, in graphic art. Um, and here movement, sorry, I, I think I need to stop this. No, sorry about that. Uh, why movement is important for us to study is that it is known since at least the 1990s that humans are very good at approximating how traces in particular in visual art are created and they can recover some approximation of the, the speed and acceleration of these traces. So to just give, try to convince you of that, how it's possible, if you start asking different people, how was this calligraphic uh, item produced, they will come up with a description of brush strokes and these will be uh, coherent uh, across uh, many uh, observers. So we are pretty, pretty good at figuring out how an art piece was produced and the quality of these traits will influence our evaluation of the aesthetics. This project over the years since 2015, roughly ongoing, has involved um, collaboration with many teams. I won't go through the details, but here you have teams, for example, Constance, who work in robotics and painting, EDAP, it's robotics and machine learning, polytechnic, expertise in understanding human movement, and writing in particular, Leuven, these are lab psychology lab. And more recently, we work with Google Art and Machine Intelligence Group and Adobe Research and Computer Graphics. Uh, so graffiti is of interest to us. It's a modern form of calligraphy. It's made of very rapid gestures. Uh, it becomes excellent over years when you develop your skills here. It's Daniel Berio, my main collaborator, at Goldsmith and some examples of the type of artistic outcome we can produce. Uh, in terms of the models that we, we can uh, refer to in, in modeling, in modeling is uh, what we call the sigma log normal model. This is uh, the, the curves that you see in the mid, mid part of the slide here. And these uh, represent the kinematics aspects or how the, the, the speed, so-called speed profile of each gesture that's used to create a trace. And on the left side, you have an example of three ways of rendering the same gestures. So you have two gestures, two, three target. These are the red lines. They're always the same. What's different is at what speed each gesture goes and how these uh, gestures are combined or not. And as you see that as you combine the speed profile of each gesture, you get smoother uh, performance in the trace. 
And here you have a graffiti tag on the right and its speed profile using the sigma log normal model. So with such a good uh, computational model, I could go into detail, but I don't have time, but this is particularly good for the expert. Well, uh, yeah, by the expert, I mean an artist who is doing very rapid uh, movements in creating these uh, traces. Uh, so once we have a good mo uh, computational model, we can embed it into some uh, robotic system. So I'll give you just some illustration of that very quickly. Uh, here are some digital models of robots we simulate first, and eventually uh, we map these models into uh, concrete robot. So here's the Baxter, which is a non-rigid border robot uh, from the control viewpoint. So this relates to talk by Professor Lida. We've, over the years, uh, we, we've developed different um, aspects of uh, how we uh, model the processes in detail. So just to give, to conclude, to give you some pointers, you have some work uh, on the sigma log normal model more, uh, with more details. You have some work using recurrent neural networks we've heard of before, where you learn different parameters. And more recently here, very quickly, some work with the people at Adobe Research. So this is in computer graphics at the top, sketching and layering graffiti primitives. Some work with in robotics with uh, Sylvain Calinon in Switzerland, works uh, with Plamondon in Montreal, specialist of kinematics reconstruction and sigma log normal model, work with psychologists uh, led by Rebecca Chamberlain at, at Goldsmith, uh, and uh, work with artists as well here with Guido Salandini. And if you're interested, this book was recently edited by myself and others uh, and has uh, many chapters by artists, uh, roboticists, computer scientists, giving different perspectives on how the field is moving forward. What we will explore next, we want to map uh, traces and texture to strokes and gestures. So exploring more in the world of painting understanding. Uh, eventually, we'd like to combine uh, our research with uh, notions of haptics and touch, which give strong feedback to the human artist. Uh, explore further human machine collaboration, and then continue to work with artists and other collaborators, roboticists, cognitive scientists, AI specialists. So this is my last slide. I hope I have convinced you that uh, our art and tools and machines have co-evolved, matured together within our collective intelligence. And this is part of our history as a species, almost like a species to continuously extend our cognitive horizon. And in this context, art is a, one of the distinctive original traits of human intelligence. It stands at the roots of writing, semiotics, architecture, engineering, math. And it deserves, I would say, a place of choice in the future of AI and robotics. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, quite sort of, you know, uh, from the sort of human histories, you know, humans, uh, you know, are always already technical beings will invent and live with their tools. So um, you mentioned the machine uh, tools or extension of the body. The computer are most of, one of the most sophisticated tools. So this idea, it could be interesting to discuss further, I think. Um, some media theorists such as uh, Catherine Hales, uh, she seems to consider computer today could be a dark quintessential cognitive technology, she said. So for her computer today, the sophisticated cognitive capacities, which enable them to si simulate any other system from like uh, transportation systems to home applicants, of course, maybe drawing robots. So this sense computer today could not be just a simple tool, uh, something more, more than that. Um, you introduce like one of your publications, the machine as art, that machine as artist. This is a fascinating so topic. At the same time, a very challenging issue, I think. Yes, okay. So now I think we move on to a uh, discussion. Uh, we have uh, one discussion from uh, Tokyo University's uh, Shinji Yamanaka. Um, uh, he's, a, yeah, he's a professor uh, on uh, at Inter, Inter Faculty Initiative in Information Studies, Institute of Industrial Science, University of Tokyo. And uh, as a design engineer, he had designed industrial products ranging from 
wrist watches to railway carriage, and while also developing the technology behind the robots and the tech, te telecommunication systems. He graduated BA Engineering University of Tokyo in 1982 and spent five years at Nissan Motor Design Center uh, before becoming a freelance industrial designer in 18, uh, 1983 and 1987. So in 1994, he founded his industrial design practice, Leading Edge Design, where he serves as a president. And he recent research focused on re-examining the relationship between humans and man-made objects through projects such as beautiful prosthetics and lifelike robot. So he has been awarded numerous honors, including 2004 Mainichi Design Award, sponsored by the major Japanese newspaper Mainichi Shimbun, and IF Design Award, and the Multiple Good Design Award. Uh, this is supported by the uh, Japan Ministry of Economy, Trade, and Infrastructure. In his 2010 work, uh, Type Garage Kit, Tag Tag Garage Kit. Uh, it's a part of the New York Museum of Modern Art's permanent collection. Okay, so I uh, please, uh, Professor Emilica, could you start here? Yes. Yeah. Okay, just start. So, can you see why on my title page? Okay. That's fine. Thank Hello, you. everybody. Yeah. My name is Shunji Yamanaka, and uh, I'm a design engineer, as I said. And actually, I will uh, uh, give a short introduction to my design work. And after that, ask some questions for uh, speakers. And Oh, I'm I'm the design. I'm, uh, I designed many things. Uh, the, uh, the the today's theme one one theme is a drawing. Uh, this is my drawing. Yeah, uh, for product and this uh, product I designed. Uh, uh, as I said, some are uh, awarded and some are selected. Uh, New York MoMA and. Uh, uh, my work is not only a styling product, but uh, user experience. For example, uh, you can see wire ticket gate uh, system almost every station in Japan. Uh, if you visit Japan, you you can uh, you can do it. Yeah, so I designed it format and uh, a basic shape through prototyping process and. Uh, uh, as a result, uh, uh, 70 million people are using the system in Japan. And uh, these are recent product I designed. Also, uh, in, as a professor of the, the, the University of Tokyo, I designed many prototypes, yeah. This uh, exhibition is a Japan uh, exhibited in Japan House in London, uh, 2018 March. <laughs> This exhibition is a very good summary of my love activities. So even from this short movie, you will be able to understand some of what we are looking for. 
For example, these are prototypes showing the possibility of additive manufacturing, so so called three D printing. In total, two, 260,000 people in four cities visited our prototype in Tokyo, uh, Los Angeles, uh, Singapore, Sao Paulo, and London. Yeah. Uh, this is my first robot designed in 2021. Cyclops, and it's called Cyclops. Cyclops has a spherical joint, it's a metal spine. Uh, also, artificial muscles driven by air pressure, and it's able to gently swivel and bend. So, in addition, it has a built in video camera on its head and programmed to uh, view and respond to passing movement. So, it's a very lazy robot, only gazing people. This is our approach of the human robot, but uh, usually robot is uh, something to do, uh, and they do something work or labor. So, but uh, this robot is only viewing. People dance and web they are hiding from the cyber scene in Nepal to gain the attention of the robot. People feel that said a robot is very intelligent, but uh, of course it's an illusion of the machine. So uh, He said, uh, and, uh, we have just uh, sold the soft robotics, many soft robotics in the presentation of uh, Humi Aida. Uh, my approach is a little different, but it's, uh, this is a, a kind of soft robot. At the first glance, it may look like uh, uh, soft materials made from, from soft materials, but actually they are rigid structure and made by hard material. So I'm a designer, so uh, Mr. Ida uh, just developed a soft robot, but uh, I designed looks like soft. This is another approach of the so, uh, study of the intrinsic behavior of a living organism. So, it was designed and developed by Mitsuru Muramatsu Associate Research of my area, of my <laughs> Uh, studies. Collaborated with Manfred Hild, a German neuroscientist. Uh, uh, in the posture, the joint contains a mortar which is programmed to register external parts. This motor rotates opposite direction to rotation caused by gravity. As a result, uh, try to lift its body in the same way as a human being stand up. Yeah, all 
I try to stand, but it can't stand. <laughs> this is a prototype for embodied insurance. Really. Ready to crawl is a 3D printed robotic project. designed a new three-dimensional structure. This structure we call 3D cam. The reason why this structure had never made is very simple. Any existing tooling process could not make it. Yeah, additive manufacturing, sometimes called pre-home manufacturing, enables such uh, sophisticated life life behavior instead of precise work. Now, lastly, I would like to the new pro the new project. The next robot is uh, face on globe and the joint attention call. Uh, developed by Daisuke, is our student of doctoral course. Very simple uh, spherical robot. Yeah. If someone uh, call him, it makes face and turn to him. That's all. So he designed this as a uh, agent of the artificial engine. Jack is a joint attention cone. It's a cone-shaped robot and tilt its apex in the, in the direction of the human gaze. Yeah, uh, this is a, uh, it's a uh, um, so Yuki and guides uh, research in the search that you see, uh, she have a joint attention. So, this is a prototype for robot joint attention for humans. So, uh, this is a short summary of my work and, uh, and today it's the theme, yeah. So this uh, today's theme is a very roughly 
artificial intelligence and uh, human brain and artificial body and the uh, body and human body. So these uh, maps is a very important and uh, all, all of the important themes in, uh, is, uh, in themes are on the crossing point of this direction. So, uh, so my questions, Mr. Ida, what I find interesting about your robot is that even though they are all bio-inspired, but the lizard, lizard is a lizard robot, you do not necessarily resemble living features. So. Uh, so they are uh, quite uh, making process is very similar, but result is quite different. That is my my, my interesting point. I wonder you know, if research was led to future robots with bodies that resemble human or animals' bodies, or will they be completely different? How do you think of that uh, mistake? This is my first question. And I, I would like to show three questions for each people. And the second is, uh, so second question is, uh, Nagai-san, it's very, uh, nagai -san studied very interesting for anal to analyze the process by which the child acquires ability to draw. So uh, especially the way to discuss drawing in relation to prediction and the sensation is very clear. I am uh, much impressed. But uh, one question is, in your experiment, the robot does not recognize the object. So that is, uh, they can see, imitate picture uh, of face, but uh, so, um, they they see picture, but uh, they don't they don't know uh, people's face itself. So uh, can we say that robots are learning to draw? Yeah, <laughs> is it true? So <laughs> um, so this is a second question. Yeah, and also. This question is quite similar uh, uh, for uh, Mr. I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah. No, no, sorry. Uh, so, so last last presentation, my my I forgot my uh, his name. I'm sorry. <laughs> and uh, and um, so. So you are robots also very beautiful, make very beautiful drawing, especially uh, I much impressed uh, project uh, graphic. So uh, to, uh, so you 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 developed a lot of new robots, the just uh, new robots for. Uh, gesturing, gesture transfer. So using gesture transfer for uh, making graffiti. That is a point, that point is very uh, impressive for me. But uh, same for, uh, same uh, question I, I have. That robot uh, is really la learning to draw. So, <laughs> Yeah, so as a result, can AI and robots share creativity with humans? This is a uh, simple but uh, important point of view for us through these themes. Okay. Yeah, thank you. So uh, this is my uh, questions and uh, if uh, I want uh, these questions are the starting point of the discussion of today. Thank you. 
Well, fantastic. Thank you very much. So beautiful works. Uh, always I'm blessed your <laughs> Yamasaka-sensei's works. Okay, uh, now I think you got the uh, three questions. Uh, uh, maybe with you, Fumia, Fumia, could you start first? Chances, uh, yamasaka Professor Yamasaka's comments and question. Yes, absolutely. Thank you very much for uh, all the presentations today. And uh, there are lots of common themes uh, across all the presentations. And uh, I, I think this is the discussion is very interesting. Uh, and especially Professor Yamanaka talked about what's the um, body of robots in the future. I think that th this is one of the, you know, the, the, the common uh, features that all of us are actually thinking, right? How the all the embodied interaction actually happens in a creative manner, uh, especially how the robot is going to be in the future is uh, uh, is not an easy question to answer, I would say. Um, but having said that, I think uh, there are a couple of things we um, uh, we need to probably point out. The first thing is that embodiment is the uh, something about the physical system environment interactions. So it, it's not enough to just thinking about the body of robot itself, uh, but it's more about interaction with the environment by using the body and, uh, um, and interaction. So if you look at only body of robot, it's not enough, right? It's just a part of the whole equation. The equation uh, is complete when you include them environment and the body interacting to each other. So uh, I think that's probably give us a bit of answer to your question about, okay, how does the system environment interactions uh, should be set and uh, should be considered um, and uh, for those robots useful and uh, you know, who, which are able to survive in long term, um, you, you always need to think of what the boundary conditions, like uh, uh, in what environment this robot is living or, or surviving or functioning, uh, or how this robot work with human beings, uh, and what kind of function human wants, and how the human want to um, live with this uh, artificial agent. Um, and, uh, um, you know, it does not necessarily mean that it has to look like humans, right? So for those machines, like the coffee machines, you know, they are very useful for us. And the design of coffee machines has its own shape because of its function. So the coffee machine doesn't need to look like humans. Uh, and uh, that kind of uh, discussion is probably very important. Some of them might have to look like human because, you know, the facial expression, for example, right? Um, it's uh, very important for humans to communicate uh, in a very nuanced um, uh, topics and uh, all that kind of things is very important. If you want to play piano, uh, with the robots, then the robots need to have a hand like humans probably because piano is made human body. So that's the kind of things that, that I'm thinking about. I'm not really directly answer to your question, but I think uh, the important thing is the embodied interactions between system and environment is the key to answer your question. And hopefully that will give us a bit of an interesting discussions um, um, starting from uh, 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 Professor Yamanaka. Okay. Yes. Uh, okay. So maybe uh, we move into the uh, Nagai Sensei. Maybe you, could you say something about uh, sort of uh, learn to draw robot? Can robot can uh, learn to draw? <laughs> yep. <laughs> Thank you, Professor Yamanaka, for a very simple but very critical question. And so my short answer to your question, sorry. <clears throat> so your question is, can Robert run to draw? And my short answer is, it can't yet. It cannot yet. But in near future, we hope that we can already design such an autonomous robot the learning mechanism for drawing. and. My understanding is that there are currently there mainly two mechanisms are missing in our robots. The first one is their 
kind of image recognition ability. As I said before, our current robot learning that we prepare the training data so that the robot can just reproduce their desired the training patterns. So the robot does not do the image recognition yet. But there, as you know, there are currently there, there are many deep neural network models which can learn the many different images and then it can learn the kind of categories of the object. For example, thereby learning the many different person's face, the network can learn a category of face. So regardless of the small changes in the face size or colors or any the shape and so on. And then that by using such a deep network model, we can expect that we can are we enable our robots to reproduce many different types of face. For example, if the network utilizes the higher layer representation of the network, which have the more abstract the information of their input signal, and then the robot will produce the more abstract the drawing. Whereas that if we utilize the more lower layer of the network, the, net, the robot can produce more detailed their drawing patterns, mm -hmm. and which can also nicely they're corresponding to the, our human brain. Human brain also has the hierarchical layers and the lower layer represent the local but detailed information, whereas the higher layer represent the more abstract information. So in this way, by integrating like a deep convolutional the network architecture in our learning system, the net, the, our robot would be also enabled to learn their uh, first recognize the world and then produces the different types of drawing. That's the first point that I we can develop integrate in the future. And the second missing part is that I think the intrinsic motivation to learn to draw. The mm. human children enjoy drawing. They are not asked to draw. They are just enjoying drawing. They have the motivations to draw. We don't know yet why this motivation is already inherently in children or not, but from their evolutionary point of view, we can imagine that the drawing played a, like an, a symbol currently. When their humans did not have symbol yet, they didn't have their good uh, way of communication. So instead of using the symbol, humans started using drawing in order to convey the information in a distant place. So then they, I think their children somehow acquire this their drawing motivation or drawing necessity in their evolutionary or the developmental path, and then they enjoy the drawing itself. And they, Currently, the, the drawing and the motivation mechanism is not well uh, connected yet, but in our community, there, there are some researchers who try to design the intrinsic motivation mechanism into robot so that the robot can decide what to learn next by itself. Instead of ha having the designer who always provide a training signal, but the robot can decide what to learn next. And the key idea he, here is, again, they're based on the predictive coding. If the robot can minimize the prediction error, that reduces the prediction error, it becomes a motivation for the robot to learn. If, for example, the task is too difficult, the prediction error does not decrease at all. This is not interesting to the robot. And also, that if the prediction error, error is too small, always, it's also boring. It's too easy. But then the, if the target gradually decreases the prediction error while the robot uh, increases its experiences, the robot can have the kind of motivation in training, in learning this target. And this mechanism allows the robot to explore the world by itself and also find something interesting, new to experience. So we hope that we can also integrate this uh, intrinsic motivation mechanism into robots so that the robot is also inherently motivated to draw. That would be the, I think the yeah. two the mechanisms that we hopefully we can implement in the near future so that yeah. you, we can address to your question. That's a very, yeah, fascinating. Well, uh, yeah, impressive answer, thank you. <laughs> yeah, the, the other, as a drawing artist, uh, the, the drawing myself, uh, the, the drawing is uh, uh, exploring the world itself. Yeah, mm. and the drawing is 
Uh, and, and another point of view, drawing is a communication tool. So mm. to show drawing is very important. So uh, maybe that is a uh, second motivation. So, mm. Yeah, I completely agree. And I also want to learn what is your <laughs> very strong motivation for drawing? <laughs> yeah. Mm. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah, thank you very much. Okay. Right, mm. okay, maybe so Tribido, it's kind of related to the autonomous kind of machine and self learning. And this is also something related to a uh, robot can have uh, creativity. <laughs> so this is maybe, you know, this question maybe uh, I want to throw to Frederick. Uh, could you talk about, you're talking about arts, so the artistic capacity, uh, how far, you know, you can think about robot that can take. Thank you. Um Thank you for the, the, the questions are all brilliant, uh, Professor Yamanaka. Um, I, I would, if, I, if we had time, I would try to dive into each of them. Um, <clears throat> I'll be very brief on the, the first two, but let, let's, let me try to address the, the third one, which was directed more to, towards me, share creativity uh, with humans, AI and robots. So um, I think uh, this is more of a, of a dream or a goal uh, for the research community. Uh, mainly because our, our robots and AI systems uh, are, are still not, uh, I would say, self-aware, if you want. Uh, and we just heard about uh, notions of motivation, uh, being bored. So all, all these types of behaviors are, are far from being fully understood in humans themselves. And therefore, it's very difficult to imagine when can we have these kinds of behaviors embedded in our machines, more sophisticated machines. So for me, I, I see more uh, current AI robots and, and robotics and, and the near future as, as means to, to explore and understand better what is creativity in humans. Uh, this is one aspect. This would be the sort of research, more scientific agenda. At the same time, uh, if I think of the artist or the pr practitioner or the the, the, the applications, uh, I think uh, we can think of these systems as uh, extension for uh, a human uh, creator. Uh, so these uh, systems can be thought of, how can I reuse this technology uh, in, in order to um, uh, promote my own creativity uh, and, and explore perhaps new means of, for example, drawing. Uh, so related to your first question, um, the bodies of robots or machines, uh, I don't see any constraints uh, needed here. So I, I don't tend to think that we need to have only humanoid robots in these contexts. Um, uh, you show beautiful designs and um, these uh, robotic systems uh, can have all kinds of forms. And this is actually really interesting for the, the, the creative person, let's say the artist. Uh, perhaps more stimulating and how, how else can I uh, explore uh, the world of um, creativity. Uh, so I see more AI robots, at least for now and in the near future, as uh, domains which allow humans to expand their potentials. Uh, so this relates perhaps to the notion of cognitive origin. Uh, one as another aspect, overall aspect that I didn't really make explicit that make humans uh, a special species is that we are continuously through our history extending, always extending our cognitive horizons. And to our knowledge, no other species is able to do that. Uh, so AI and robots can, can play a, a huge role in, in, in keeping us extending uh, this, this horizon. Uh, robots learning to draw. Uh, yeah, I, I agree with um, <clears throat> Professor Nagai. It's, it's way too early. Uh, there's so many aspects of uh, what it implies to learn uh, and explore, uh, for example, via drawing uh, to understand what, what is the need for that. Uh, I try to emphasize a sort of hint, give a hint that historically speaking, this seems to have been a, a key factor that allowed us to, to become something else than just another great ape. Um, but why and, and how is this uh, appearing? If we can answer that question, then I think we'll, we'll be able to um, create robots that, that are sort of our cousins. Uh, but that's 
I don't know, I, I couldn't say when this will happen. Mm. Yes, yes, it's a big, uh, it's a really big question. What do you think, uh, Professor Ida, it's about creativity, or you're talking about uh, self-evolution, or, you know, self-organization, uh, something if you, uh, if a robot has such kind of capacity, it's, is it possible to become one day, they have their own uh, creativity? Yeah, uh, thank you. I think that's an excellent question, and uh, which overarch uh, among all the all, all of our exciting research projects. Uh, so, from my point of view, um, you know, at the moment, robots and computers are doing a lots of lots of trials and errors, and to achieve something, um, and you make a lots of lots of errors in order to achieve small success. And um, but I. I I don't think this is the nature of a creativity. Of course, you know, my mother robots, evolution uh, robots, that is doing almost random errors uh, to find something, something interesting. Uh, but, you know, I, I don't think this is, uh, this is not going to go too far as far as we follow this uh, principle, but we need some other mechanism uh, it could be, you know, called like uh, um, intrinsic motivation, like what the uh, Nagai sensor said. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, you know, how can we find some, you know, so-called gut feeling, right? <laughs> uh, where this gut feeling comes from, uh, and what's the intuition comes from? I think this is a really the big mystery at the moment. How we can think about about it? How we can do science about this? Uh, mm -hmm. or science or engineering about this. I think that's a, that's a really big question. And I personally have no idea yet, uh, but one of the, um, the point is that we need to have a really, really uh, well-connected distributed systems that, uh, you, know, um, you know, lots of neurons in our body or lots of experience in our brain uh, contributes to uh, have this uh, kind of creativity and gut feeling. And that's something we don't know yet. Uh, but uh, that's a common uh, feature or common questions that we all need to address, I suppose. Right. Okay. Exactly. Uh, I felt uh, you are in your project, and uh, I felt in the new creativity, creativity, baby create, create baby of creativity so in your uh, mother robot in genome process. Yeah, so so it can create a new way to move and a new way to uh, structure a new structure of the creature. So it's a very uh, impressive for me. Oh, what uh, this is like uh, some creation to it. So, yeah. Yes. And uh, also, I just finally sort of wanted to just add it uh, about uh, Yamanaka Sensei's work, you know, sort of lifelike uh, project. And this is also related to something about uh, Nagai Sensei talk about sort of motivations. Uh, when we communicate uh, robot, we have some kind of emotional uh, sort of in touching, you know, feeling. So well, when you know, Yamanaka Sensei make uh, you know, it's a very uh, simple uh, cyclos, you know, first of all, what? just uh, cameras, eyes, but the people just in front of them, you know, just the sort of dancing, you know, waving, waving hands and they say something. So what I was thinking is, you know, when human communicate robot, the point is you also talked about sort of extract uh, this essence of the something what makes things uh, lifelike. So human being, you know, our perception is not necessarily need everything, you know, we just need sort of selected information, that's enough. So this is a sort of, in other sense, it talks about our sort of info, human uh, information processing process is always called filtered and then going to sort of massive chaos level to filter, getting more ordered and then abstract. So this is a kind of interesting sort of to think about. You know, we have uh, our perception uh, and also, you know, information uh, processing process. We were always thinking about similar uh, sort of chaotic stage to uh, bootstrap stage. That's really sort of fascinating to think about for me. Yes, very interesting. Right. So anything else? You know, you sort of each other. You can just exchange comments on your project, or because time is running almost. So 
if you don't have anything, you know. Okay, right, okay. So, yes, so thank you very much. Uh, really fascinating, amazing project, you know, uh, introduced us and uh, I'm sure a, a lot of audience enjoyed it and learned a lot today. Uh, thank you for joining us. We really, uh, I really hope AI society, AI and the society, this series could deliver valuable point and uh, pose, pose positive proposal and negative questions in order to better understand uh, the world we live, which continuously evolving uh, in complex dynamics between the social, the biological, and the technical beings. So, yes, and thank you so much, Professor Fumiya Ida and the Professor Yuki Nagai and the Professor Frederick Hol Hol Lei Mali and uh, Professor Shunji Yamadaka for participating, participating in this event. I'd like to also thank you, uh, General Bridgestone, Director of the Institute for Creative and Cultural Entrepreneurship and Administrators, and the MENA, the Journal Theory, Culture, and Society. So, yeah, um, this is the final seminar, AI and the Society Series, but we do hope I do hope I keep our conversation on another occasion and uh, sometime in the future. Thank you for listening. Thank you for attention. Thank bye you. for now. Yeah, bye for now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, you very much. For Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Yeah. Well done. Great.